used to be a personal assistant and joins us on the program now. Alan, good afternoon to you. Maybe a good starting point for this conversation is for you to tell us the first time that you met her, I think it was in Brantford, and uh, what your impressions were. The first time, Jeremy, that I met her was in Brantford in the very early 1980s. I was a very young undergraduate student of Professor Fatima Mir in Durban, and Professor Mir wanted very much to go and visit Mrs. Mandela where she was in exile in Brantford, and we drove up in a very, very cold free state winter to Brantford, made our way to her house, which people have seen many images of now, but it was quite extraordinary because she'd taken this very, very small house, which was very simple, and she'd built around it a very beautiful garden. She had a willow tree, patch of grass, a dove coat, and some pink roses at the gate. And it was an extraordinary impression because she really was defiant in that she would not be broken by what had been done to her in sending her there into isolation. When you say she was defiant during that first meeting, Alan, how did you sense that? Was it in her tone? Was it in the language? Was it in references that she made? Well, I had known about her from Professor Mir for quite a long time, so I had an understanding of who she was. But it was very clear that it was not a broken person who we were meeting. She was extraordinarily beautiful, as people repeatedly mention, also extremely articulate, but very, very nice. She was a very kind person. And I think that is one of the things which people are remembering now, is that to everyone, she was kind. She wasn't only familiar with important people. She was familiar and friendly and caring about everyone, which was one of her great strengths, I think. It's one of the ways she survived, is that she never lost sight of individuals. She never ceased to care about people and their humanity. How did you end up working with her? Well, after meeting her in the early 1980s, a lot of the work and a lot of activism which emanated from her and around her was done from Professor Mir's office at the University in Durban. There was constant, in fact, almost daily contact between Professor Mir and her by telephone. Uh, Mrs. Mandela used to have to walk into the public call box in, this, in the Brantford town, which is attached to the post office, and she would wait there for calls to come through. If I remember correctly, the number was Brantford 9909. And then when in 1994 we came to the transition and she was, to her own surprise, appointed as the Deputy Minister of Arts and Culture, she phoned me and asked me if I would come down to Cape Town and act as her private secretary in the Deputy Ministry. And so I then moved down to Cape Town to join her there. How did she organize her day? When he was a very busy person, um, not only purely in terms of parliamentary work, but also because she had an enormous constituency within the country, which now that she was in an official position felt that they were able to reach out to her to assist them with whatever issues they needed assistance with, but also because she had an enormous international constituency as well. So apart from the contact from people within the country who were hoping to engage with her to assist them in various ways, there was also constant contact both from media and individuals from the international community who also wanted to make contact with her. And then, of course, in terms of her parliamentary work, she remained a very active and enthusiastic member of the African National Congress and had a particular leadership style in that she was very consultative. So our office was always filled with people, both when she was a deputy minister and once she was no longer a deputy minister and moved over to the National Assembly building. There were constant streams of other members of parliament, members of the ANC, people who'd made appointments to see her, who would come from when she arrived in the morning until she left at night to see, with, to see her. And all of those engagements generated a large amount of work both for her and for the people who worked for her. And yet, Alan von Zydem, and it, it's a very kind of millennial question to ask, she was also able to an extent to maintain a work-life balance. In other words, the work was important, but there was time for her family, if I, if I recollect and am not mistaken. She did, like all MPs, return to Gauteng over weekends. So she was in Cape Town during the weeks, but she would fly back to Gauteng over weekends. And if there were no official engagements in Gauteng over the weekends, that would be time for her family, which 
always throughout her life remained enormously important to her and I think one of her great regrets which she re expressed many times was how her family particularly her two daughters had suffered because their mother was Winnie Mandela. Then we fast forward to her 80th birthday and you write a very moving piece I think it's either a letter to her and you talk about many people who you describe as Judas's who turned their backs on her. What were you referring to? It was a very difficult political time and I see now people who I know to have turned their backs on her or to have avoided her or to have not supported her struggle who are now anxious to be seen with her and that's fine if people have made peace with what they did and have realized that they made a mistake, that is okay. But I think the thing to remember about Winnie is it was never about her personally. Winnie had a political position. Her entire being was the political position. And her discomfort with the post-1994 dispensation was because she was deeply uncomfortable with the direction in which she understood the political direction of the country to be taking. What specifically was she concerned about and how did she articulate that? She spoke frequently about the fact that, in her opinion, the government of national unity and the nature of the transition was a betrayal, and those were her words, of the liberation struggle, that particularly it had engineered a transition which was of very little use to the majority of particularly black but all poorer South Africans and advantaged only a very small elite. And she wasn't afraid to raise that with members of the ruling party? Not at all. She, re she raised it repeatedly, both privately and in the public domain. She made numbers of speeches at that period where she criticized the way the way the apartheid government was treating them. And she must have, as she was raising these particular issues, then become very frustrated with the inertia. She became very frustrated with the political direction, but the one extraordinary thing about Winnie is she never ever gave up hope for the African National Congress. She may, remained right until the end absolutely loyal. She felt, as she articulated all the way through her life, that errors were made but that didn't prompt her to leave the party. She felt that the party would correct. And she continually pursued that in raising the issues which she felt that were incorrect, in engaging with individuals, in pointing out what she felt was problematic. It made her unpopular with a certain sector of the political community, but not with others who understood what she was talking about. I think it's News 24 today that quotes a family friend who said that uh, she died of a broken heart. Uh, people who struggled for this country, uh, uh, this person is quoted as saying, uh, to be free, uh, see that their hard work was being abused as it is being abused right now. And essentially, that's what you're saying uh, in terms of the frustration that she felt. Um, did she die of a broken heart? I can't answer that with any reliable insight into what she was thinking in the last days of her life. But I think the one thing about her is she never gave up hope. Even when it seemed impossible, and I refer back now to the first years that I knew her from the early 1980s, there was never one moment of doubt in her mind that she would be victorious, that the country would enter a more just dispensation. And I'm reasonably certain that even up to her last days, she was confident that the African National Congress, which she regarded as the only realistic vehicle for pursuing the kind of society she envisaged for the particular reasons that she envisaged it would succeed in doing that. When last did you talk to her? I spoke to her about two weeks before her death. Um, yes, about two weeks before her death. Are you able to tell us what the nature of the conversation was or was that too private? As she got older we spoke 
she was very she remained very interested in what was happening I work in Cape Town in Parliament and she was always very interested in what was happening in Parliament what the political atmosphere was in Parliament she always used to inquire about the political atmosphere she remained a member of Parliament she was interested in the work that was taking place in Parliament what had been happening in the house and we used to talk about the house in terms of the National Assembly mm -hmm. and we used to talk about what had been happening there and to the extent that I could brief her I would brief her on any information which had come my way. She was very engaged with the processes. She had a wide range of people whom she spoke to and who kept her constantly informed. But also because I come from a rural town, uh, Mama had in Soweto a large flock of chickens. Um, and the chickens would cackle and crow in the background when we spoke on the phone. And she would talk about her youth, and particularly in relation to the chickens, described her father keeping chickens. And I think increasingly as she grew older, she had begun to reminisce about her very early life. Alan Van Zyden, th thank you very much indeed. Uh, deep respect for you for coming on and, and, and sharing those, uh, those memories. Uh, Winnie Marikazela Mandela's former private secretary, Alan Van Zyden, uh, live in Cape Town uh, for Newsday. Uh,